Hi everyone, welcome to Bringing Virtual Care Home. My name is Tina Nall. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at Anelto and I'll be your host. My guest today is Dr. Jeffrey Kong, the CEO of WellBe Senior Medical. Today our conversation will be the importance of value-based, low-cost, high-quality care for the aging population. Welcome Dr. Kong to the show. Thank you, Tina. I'm really looking forward to it. Good. Let's start out um, our conversation by having you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your company. Yeah, so maybe a little bit about myself. So I am a geriatrician. There, there are very few of us in the country. But uh, I, I like to think about my career maybe in four buckets. One, which is uh, I used to work for the government. So uh, I was the first chief medical officer of CMS that the country ever had. Uh, second is I have a pretty strong retail healthcare background. I ran all of Walgreens emerging businesses. Uh, third, I have a very strong payer background. I was the chief medical officer at Cigna for nine years. Then fourth, most important in this conversation is I'm first and foremost a provider. So I ran a group of geriatricians 40 years ago um in Boston and then I was president of Chen Med most recently and now I'm CEO of Wellbe Senior Medical. Um maybe just on Wellbe Senior Medical just real quick uh I as a geriatrician I really have a passion for what I call the frail elderly. You know people, you know all of us including yourself I'm sure have like a grandmother or a grandfather or an aunt or uncle who's frail, disabled, seven or eight chronic diseases, you know, 12 medications, and they just can't get into the doctor's office. Wellbe Senior Medical basically brings geriatric care to the patient's home. So we, ba we take that same care that you're getting in a doctor's office, we bring it directly into your home. That is amazing. Um, I did a little research on your website and saw that you are in three states in the United States right now, one of which is where I reside in Ohio. And I think I first heard about your company from my daughter, who's also a nurse, um, who told me about this really cool concept. And I'm not positive about this fact, but I think you might have brick and mortar in my neighborhood in Dublin, Ohio. Is that accurate? So actually, when you say brick, so first of all, just as an aside, um, I'm glad you heard of us because Ohio is one of our largest states. We got over, almost 24, 25,000 members there that we're caring for. Um, glad you heard about us. Uh, I, maybe second thing is i glad you don't need us. Um, <laughs> my guess is you and your daughter probably uh, don't need us. But yeah. um, <laughs> yet, that's right, yet. But but I think um, in answer to question that we do have a we have a we call it our um, nest where basically the clinical teams get together and I'm pretty sure it's in Dublin. The point though is all of our clinicians are out on the road in in patients' homes seeing the patients, but we do not bring the patients into that office. That's more of a headquarters, right? And right. Uh, but we're we're all the care is in the patients' home. Yeah, I, I find that absolutely amazing. Um, while I'm currently at Anelto, which is a remote patient monitoring healthcare technology company, my position prior to entering the uh, healthcare technology world was on the home care side of the world. Um, and while we had skilled nursing and PT and um, OT and, and home health aides, there wasn't a lot of medical visits being made in the home. Um, so this is wonderful to hear because it really does bridge that, that social determinants of health gap that seniors are faced with um, and still need to have management of these chronic conditions as you uh, shared. So um, can you tell us how the pandemic um, has influenced your model of care? Um, happy to, but before I get into it, you just said something. If you're, if you're okay, I just like to yeah, really sure. want to make sure I... You know, so first of all, as a physician, you get this. Um, when you really break down what happens in a doctor's office, about 90, 95% of it can be done in a patient's home. We do a history, we do an exam, draw a blood test, do an electrocardiogram, like so. So I really think that that um, you can appreciate that getting that medical care, you know, you talked about 
skilled PT, OT, but getting that medical care in the, someone's home is really key. Uh, before I answer the COVID question, I, I think I need to kind of just step back, if you don't mind, and then I'll go back sure. to the COVID question. Just kind of, why why care in the home? And, and you know, I, I guess I'm old enough, but you'll probably remember this, maybe 40 or 30 or 40 years ago, we really talked about access to care was a big problem, right? Well, one of the solutions to access to care, mm -hmm. instead of bringing the patient to the care, you bring the care to the home. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what's been really interesting is 20 years ago, we, we acted like we solved the access problems, and we haven't solved the access problems. I can't even get an appointment for a, a post-op surgical appointment. It was supposed to be scheduled yesterday, uh, and they canceled it. They're asking me to wait for six months. I mean, I, I can't believe so, but you know, I can bring that care anyway. So, twenty years ago, we t remember we talked about patient-centered care, right? Like the biggest problem in healthcare is patient-centeredness. Well, I can't think of anything more more patient-centric than seeing the patient in the comfort of their own home. I mean, just think about it. In the doctor's office, we make you strip in your jo you know, strip your clothes off, put a paper johnny on, cold floor, and all thing. So I can't think of anything more dignified and respectful and patient centered than seeing a patient at home. Now you're familiar. You mentioned this already. Now we've we're we're doing uh, we're talking about social determinants of health. Since you've done home visits. If you want to understand the social determinants of health, you see someone in health, you know exactly what's going on. They have adequate food, they have adequate housing, you know, is it dirty? What, what about their stairs, you know, the whole thing. So anyway, so the reason why I think about home care is we're solving the access issues, we're solving the patient-centered issues, and we're solving the social determinants of health. That's the kind of... Now, to your COVID question, um... It's interesting. I've been doing this home care thing for 30 or 40 years. What was really fascinating, we opened during COVID. So we have no patients. And then we opened our first market was July 2020, middle of COVID, before vaccinations. What was fascinating about it is what all I, I knew that home care was the right thing to do for all the reasons. But was what was really interesting is COVID accelerated the acceptance of that because all of a sudden, people did not want to go to the doctor's office. They wanted the safety of their own home. So we were basically, we opened it, it was really welcomed because people were like, I, I got seven diseases. I'm afraid to go see my doctor's office. Wait a second, you'll come and see me in my home? So I would say that COVID really accelerated the movement towards in-home medical care. Yeah. You are not my first guest who had that same exact perception. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to add to what you're saying about providing care in the home is it's been my opinion that that care is so much more effective because of overcoming any challenges that are presented um, and just acknowledging that oftentimes care in an office is tremendously transactional versus that interactive uh, two-way communication um, in the patient's home where you take away the white coat syndrome and have the patient in their real environment with anything that makes them feel more secure. So absolutely agree with your uh, perception. So yeah, you're, you and I are gonna become fast friends yeah. I mean, we're on the same wavelength on this. No, I'm 100% in agreement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so where do you see the standard care model for health care moving in the next five to 10 years? Well, you know, on this one, uh, I think it, I think I, I go back to kind of what I said is kind of what are the fundamental problems people are facing? We're they're facing access issues. And another way of saying it is convenience, right? Mm -hmm. So they're facing the access issues. They're facing that patient-centeredness issue. In many ways, you talked about it. I think people trust you and they, if you respectfully see them in their home, right? So that kind of establishing that trust and that empathy is really key. 
and that that patient centeredness. And then the third is this issue of the social determinants. I actually my hopes for healthcare in the next five, 10, 20 years beyond home care is that we remember those three things and that the delivery system circle creates solutions to solve access, patient centeredness, and and the social determinants of health. Uh, right now, I think it's happening in the home care space. I'm a little worried about, quite frankly, the the uh, the ambulatory care space. Now, I will say, I think the place where well the, it can switch in the ambulatory space is that we move away from fee for service to value based medicine, because in the ambulatory space right now. You're, you're, the doctors are being asked to see 20 to 30 patients a day. But when you switch to value-based, I actually think you can afford to spend more time with the patients. So I'll give you, I'm still on the board of directors of Chad Med. You know, I talk about it. They're seeing 15 to 20 patients a day. You know, they can spend more time. If I use Welby as an example, in the fee-for-service model, in order to make it work, you have to see eight to 12 patients a day. We're seeing four to six patients a day because we're 100% value-based, full risk, global risk. And I do better, or Welby does better, by keeping people healthy and out of the hospital. That is something, I'm fi- all of a sudden I'm financially aligned with what the member wants, right? Who, who, everyone wants to be healthy and stay out of the hospital. Um, and so I think that I think these value-based models in, are going to eventually help us get back to solving the access issues, the patient-centered issues, and uh, the um, uh, the social determinants of health. Yeah. So to all of that, I say Amen. We have got to quit having hospitals and ED be the front door to medical care in our country. And I um, feel extremely strong about the fact that value-based drives better clinical outcome, which equates to higher quality of life. And those of us who have you know, lived our, our lives in um, health care typically have that as a passion. So um, that is just absolutely music to my ears. Now, that said... Can I give you... Can I pile on with one proof point? Sure. Yes. So now I'm in the value-based world. We are, pay, we are paying or we are providing what we call community paramedics in the home. That's not covered in fee-for-service. Okay. Mm-hmm. But basically... I'll talk to you uh, Ohio as an example. Right now, I have about six trucks circulating in Ohio over various areas with a community paramedic. Patient calls me and says, I have an urgent or emergent problem. I get that community paramedic into their home in 30 minutes. Now, I'm the doctor sending the patient, and I know the patient. And then I'm working with that paramedic and saying, okay, based on what you see, let's start this medication. They can do IVs, they can do EKGs, the whole thing. We have shown a 33% reduction in emergency room visits from that program. Wow. I I wish I could be more articulate than wow, but I am (laughs) truly blown away. I mean, those kinds of statistics are, are just... So refreshing to hear. And um, when I, before I came again into healthcare technology, uh, the health system I ha- I was in did try a community paramedic program. They just really um, struggled for reimbursement, that kind of stuff. So I think it fizzled, um, which was a, a sad thing, but you understand. Well, that's, but that's the perfect example, right? You can't make it work in fee-for-service. Right. But in a value-based system where I'm all of a sudden now responsible and I'm the payer, mm-hmm. it's not even covered. But I'm still providing it because that's the right thing to do. Right. Absolutely. Have you given any consideration to including a remote patient monitoring aspect to your model? I knew you would ask. So... <laughs> So this is really interesting, um, and I hope you don't get offended because it's in your, it's your current, but um, 
You know, I think the value proposition for remote patient monitoring is when the doctor doesn't have enough time to kind of keep track of things. Mm -hmm. But the way, since we give our doctors and nurse practitioners plenty of time to be with the patient, I actually think it's more effective in, instead of remote patient monitoring that we either frequently see the patient or we make frequent phone calls. So I'll give you a concrete example. I mean, you're aware of this. The literature would say daily waits for congestive heart failure um, is uh, will lower hospitalizations for congestive heart failure, right? Daily, just simple daily waits. So one way of dealing with that is a remote patient monitor. Have the patient get up on their scale. And so the approach we take is we actually have our nurse practitioner or our medical assistant call the patient once a day and tell them to get on the scale and weigh themselves. Okay, so I get the same information as a remote patient monitor, but uh, from the weight standpoint, but now there's a social interaction going on. Patients love that. And during that, I can also assess, are they short of breath or has something else happened? So I get so much more information. So, so that's a long way of saying I've not, I've not rushed. We will do, we will eventually use remote patient monitoring, but I've not rushed to go to that because my value proposition is the actual interaction on a longitudinal basis with the patient. And I don't want to disintermediate my clinicians from the patient and put this remote patient on. I really, I think that in the long run, that'd be more of a supplement, but our fundamental value price is that actual human interaction with the patient. Well, um, I, I am familiar with the beginnings of uh, remote patient monitoring and the, the primary uh, target population being congestive heart failure patients and the weights. And back then I had family members with that diagnosis who were absolutely non-compliant with following that. Today's remote patient monitoring is tremendously different in a complete solution that includes the ability with a touch of a button to be face to face with the, the uh, care team member who you have a relationship with. So someday we'll have another conversation. We have another, I, another I, conversation there. Yeah, but but that. I, regardless of whether it's at the end of the day, I think you would agree that that interaction is really key. Absolutely, 100%. And so when when I am, am pitching remote patient monitoring, I am typically pitching it to include the virtual visit capability because I feel like as a clinician, if I've got qualitative data coming in from remote patient monitoring from surveys and I've got biometric data coming in from peripheral devices, if I can lay eyes on that patient, then I've got the full picture. I mean, I know I can't put my hands on them, um, but if I can connect with them and they know me, I'm going to get real information that's going to allow me to intervene early. And then so, one of so the reasons- So you and I, that, again, are violently in agreement. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons I bring this up to you is because, and I know you're well aware of this, you're dealing with the biggest demographic in our country and it's only going to grow further. So, and with providers, uh, the numbers of providers decreasing in volume. So while when I reach the point of needing you know, geriatric services, I want WellB to take care of me, but at that time, there'll be hundreds uh, to thousands to millions of others of us that will want that. And, and so just a thought <laughs> moving uh, forward. We'll definitely do that. You're, uh, I'm just glad you're far away from needing us. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm probably not that far away from meeting you. So um, it really, it really is exciting to hear you're already in my home state um, and that this is your model because this is my ideal model in my mind. So, uh, well, before we close, do you have any parting words you want to offer to the audience or any additional things you want to tell them about WellBe Senior Medical? Well, maybe just maybe one thing I mentioned. So we started in July of, of 2020, zero patients. We currently ended this year, uh, 2022, with, with over 50,000. And we're on a path for um, 
end of 2023 to be at 100,000. So we're scaling rapidly. So, uh, so you had mentioned we're in three states. Uh, this month, we're actually now entering three more states, so six states. And then probably by the end of the year, we're about maybe seven or eight states in you know, 20 markets. Okay. I, I think the point, maybe the one thing I just love to, is, is my goal or our vision is to be supplying this care model for all American citizens. So uh, that's the goal. And so I guess I invite people, uh, in particular health plans or physician groups that are in a full risk model, to just contact us. We're, we can be up and running in a new market within 90 days. So I just invite people to contact us, go to our website, wellbe.com. Uh, and then our maybe our chief growth officer is a guy named Michael Stewart. It's Michael. Dot Stuart, S T U A R T, at Welby, W E L L B E dot com. So, open invitation. We'll, we'll be happy to scale this model, bring this model to wherever you want to go. Well, I want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank you for your effort to serve. And I want to thank you for your vision because all of those are, are, uh, again, matched up with what I hope to see um, before I leave this earth as a healthcare professional for our country. And, and to all of you who joined us at Bringing Virtual Care Home today, thank you. And I hope you'll join us for our next episode soon and have a great day.